Shrewsbury Historical Society presents Cranberries 101 by Walter Morrison of the Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association about the presentation. Learn about the history of cranberries in Massachusetts, cranberry farming, and the amazing health benefits provided by this little red berry in a colorful, informative PowerPoint presentation from an industry expert. Enjoy sweetened, dried cranberry samples and take home some amazing cranberry recipe cards. Good evening. A um, little bit of a drive up here from Plymouth, but that is kind of the heartland of where cranberries are grown. Uh, if we, and we'll get into this in a minute in this slide series. Uh, most of the cranberries in this state currently are grown in the towns of Plymouth, Carver, and Wareham, and that's where you'll find the majority of the bog acreage. Even though after coming here early and talking with some of the people here, I understand there's some isolated bogs even up in this area. Before we start, I think I'd like to uh, veer off this series a little bit because they don't talk about it. The main reason why we have cranberries where we are is about geology. And uh, it fits in kind of with an historical society. Geology is about the old and how the land was before. And we have to go back to the glacial period. And glaciers basically ended in this area, or the ice pack ended in this area in the last ice age, roughly where Cape Cod is today. And that is really what formed Cape Cod. Um, I know everybody thinks of Cape Cod being over the canal, but the canal is relatively recent innovation. Um, really, geologically, you would include Plymouth, Carver, Wareham in the geology of Cape Cod because it is basically where the glaciers terminated. And when I say that's where the glaciers ended, it isn't that they ended there in terms of pushing forward. It is where they ended in terms of pushing forward, but it is where they ended in the period of their deposition of materials from up this way and further north. In other words, as the glaciers push down, as the glacier keeps on pushing forward, if its melt line, we'll call it, where it goes no further forward, from that point out, it keeps on depositing material as it has scraped it off the earth from before. So what we have down there is sands, primarily, um, over bedrock in there, 100 to 200 feet of sand, essentially, over the bedrock. Whereas up here, you see the exposed bedrock. Now, you still see isolated cranberries in this area, um, but it's in pockets of sand. That's where they would grow. And we'll get into where that native fruit does grow. So why don't we hit it from there? But I did want to talk about the geology, and that's why we see cranberries in that area. So let me begin here, and we'll start the presentation. Uh, the Cranberry Growers Association is a little bit older than your society here. We go back to 1888. But the first association actually was earlier in 1866 with the meeting of 70 growers from Barnstable County. The other part of this is um, cranberries originally, in terms of as we think of it as an agricultural crop, were started in the Dennis and Harwich area. That's where really the first... Um, man-made, we'll call it, farms got going in cranberries. Before then, the natives were already well aware of that fruit and were actually selling that fruit to the English. And it was always a wild pick. Coming back to some of the um, your wild berries that are associated in this area, there's three. Cranberries, blueberries, and your Concord grape. Two of them, if any of you are horticulturists, are vicinniums. Vicinium macrocarpum being the uh, cranberry, and the vicinium corybiosum uh, being the blueberry. And um, we could have differentiated these. You've got two kinds of blueberries in this area, both high bush and low bush. But in the area down uh, where I'm talking about, in near your marshlands down there, your bog areas, it's primarily high bush blueberry that we find down there, and that was what was harvested. 
Anyways, uh, the first association meeting when they first started was back in 1866, was a meeting of 70 growers in Barnesville County. But that association didn't last long. It went by the name of Cape Cod Growers uh, Association, um, but it, it didn't continue. And the continuous one that has started from, that I am now representing today was in 1888. And this is uh, today's mission what they what we consider what our due to, or what we're supposed to be trying to do back in 1888 the mission was to promote the interests of its members in whatever pertains to the growth cultivation and sale of cranberries they tried to make it wide open so it was one learning how to grow cranberries and two how to uh, cooperatively market them Cranberry plant, where do we find it? I will find it growing natively. We have what we call in that area, and again, this goes back to the geology, kettle ponds. And these are um, depressions in the area where we have water. You will not necessarily see an inflowing stream or an outflowing stream. It just is a reflection of the water table. You go to the sides of the pond where... And in that pond level goes up and down with the seasons or the years more appropriately in terms of the water levels, but it reflects the water table. You go to the upper end of that and you will find cranberries growing in that sandy soil, not in the water. A lot of people think, oh, cranberries, you must have wetland to grow it on. The answer is no. It just has to have water available but it's still basically grown dry, okay? Um, when they talk about the laying, we're gonna get into that next, about the um, what it consists of, but the top area is always sand. Um, it is a naturally a low pH soil. Um, when we say sandy soils, it's primarily sand, so it's a fast draining soil. We need to have the fresh water supply available, and we'll get into that and why. Uh, cool temperatures in, uh, in the fall. We're talking about there is it is a plant that is not going to grow much for, it'll grow somewhat further south, but the temperatures have to be similar to here. So if you were to look up and go to the, um, the, my favorite site that I use for horticultural information is Missouri Botanical Garden. If you went to their website, you would see that this plant, its native range is all the way from New Brunswick down to North Carolina. You're not finding it in North Carolina near the shore where it's warmer or in the Piedmont region. You're finding it in the, up in the mountains where, the, where it is cooler, where you do have that differentiation in uh, temperatures. In a neat, when they're talking about chill hours for dormancy, they were talking about a temperate plant versus a tropical plant, you the plant has to go dormant. But remember that it is an evergreen. It will change colors. The leaf color will change in the fall to a red, later in the fall to a red, but it is an evergreen. We talk about what it grows in. This is kind of a, um, a layered cake here of how a cranberry bog would be established or what it would be how it would be set up uh, today. The most important thing is that top layer of sand, uh, preferably about four inches if we were planting a new bog. And then underneath it, a reservoir of, um, it could be loam and peat um, for nutrient uh, retention. And then below that, um, might be gravel, may not, might not be and more importantly is a layer at the bottom so that uh, it actually does hold water. Coming back, as I alluded to before, that it was uh, grown here as a native berry. When the pilgrims landed here in, in the other Europeans in Eastern Mass, the natives here were already using cranberries in the first cranberries up until the early 1800s were all just a native pick plant, just as you would today going out um, and harvesting blueberries. In other words, it was not necessarily, as we would consider it, actively a managed farm. 
It was just harvested wherever there were wild patches. The, um, from the, the, uh, the second item down there, the mixed berries of the wild game, this is taking advantage of the uh, attributes of the cranberry as we know it today to help with urinary tract health that we have and is a, a very, it's considered a superfruit for its uh, beneficial um, properties <coughs> in the diet and for um, warding off different diseases. So this same berry mixed with, the, with fatty, with fat and with, and with meat was then dried and can be used as a protein source for the natives through the winter. And that, uh, it doesn't list it here, but it was called pemmican. The natives uh, ended up, once the English got here and the English developed a taste for it, they would be collecting and selling to the English those wild collected berries. And that was a means of, they used it as a means of income for themselves. Um, in 1816, so we're now looking uh, almost 200 years after the Pilgrims <laughs> landed in 1620, that was the beginning, is at least as we know it today, or it is credited to a gentleman by the name of Henry Hall in Dennis. And he made an observation. First, he was able to, tra he figured out that he could transplant clumps of sod of cranberries and move them closer together in starting to create a field. Most importantly, after one winter's storm, he had noticed in, in his bogs happened to be close to the ocean that some sand had blown over those bogs. But what was important was he made the observation is those bogs where sand had blown over actually the uh, amount of berries produced in that patch the following year greatly increased and hence be became the beginning of understanding what was necessary for long-term growth and promotion of more berries was, the, was just the physical um, uh, every five years moving a half inch to three quarters of an inch of sand over that existing carpet of vines. And he was responsible for that, and, that's, and we know today that's whom we credit with the beginning of uh, really cultivating cranberries as we know it today. But understand, it was down in Dennis and Harwich area and his neighbors around him um, that actually started uh, the business of agriculture of cranberries as we know it today. Um, we move forward to 1860s, and this is a... Um, economic fact for any of you folks that are into economics. Um, berries was starting to be sold and at that time it was finally established and remember back the first um, meeting was in 1868. And the one of the purposes of that meeting, I should have backed up, was to establish how are we going to sell berries? What's the unit of measure? And units of measure back in that time were not necessarily weight, but were, for many fruits, were volume. So it was established that a barrel of cranberries would be 110 quarts. So it wasn't done by weight. We move forward to today, it's, and berries are now doing bulk. We can't do that volume type measurement. And so it's now a barrel of cranberries is considered to be 100 pounds. So, um, Back in that time, in 1860, and I, found, I did some research to find this out, a, bar, a barrel of cranberries, and there was a bulk purchase made, and it was, uh, anyways, the price worked out to be $42.75 for a barrel of cranberries. In today's money, I did a little bit more research, that would have equaled a, a little over $1,500 for that barrel of cranberries. What's so striking, at least from an economic point of view, is you can say in 1860, 
This this farmer got forty two seventy five for a barrel of cranberries, and today that is approximately what a farmer would get for a barrel of cranberries from his uh, handler or wholesaler today. So it's 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 absolutely startling, and it is very representative of many of our agricultural crops. We now have many, much less of our population is in the business of producing food for us. And the same thing is with cranberries. The cranberry industry has had to innovate over time in order to make the food reasonable to cost with everything else. And so uh, we're obviously not getting $1,500 for a barrel of cranberries. So anyways, let's keep going here. Um, What's interesting also is think of cranberries, and I know if you've ever had a straight raw cranberry, which you can get this time of year, no sugar or anything else added to it, it is quite, um, quite sour. Um, back then, the taste, they could accept more sour, and also they did, remember they did have um, some sweeteners being both honey and maple syrup being available to them where the name cranberry comes from. And, um, and you can clearly see it from that flower and that uh, sandhill crane to the side there. Um, that cranberry flower notice is tipped upside down. It's actually a difficult pollinator because of that. And we'll come up to pollination, pollinization later. So just remember that flower and why it looks. Um, the honeybee actually has a hard time of it, but we do have to use quite a few honeybees. But native pollinators are also very important to a cranberry grower getting his crop. And your bumblebee is very easily able to uh, navigate that flower. Also, the other takeaway from this is that it is insect pollinated, not wind pollinated. And that's very important to understand for a farmer. Um, if you're a corn farmer, you're wind pollinated. If you're a cranberry farmer, you're insect pollinated. So we're talking again about Henry Hall from Dennis. He's the, uh, was in the Revolutionary War, but he is the founder of the cranberry industry as we know it and figured out that it could be planted as a crop. Um, let's come back to geology a little bit. This will make sense. Why are we seeing uh, cranberries grown in our area? I told you we needed sand. The other part of it is, back in the early history, is that land in eastern Massachusetts was our original source of iron in this country. When the Pilgrims first came here, they did not have iron out of this area or anywhere near here. It was all imported from England. So the um, swampy areas in Carver and around that area, particularly cedar swamps, they learned uh, the soil was high in iron content. That bottom picture there um, is an example of what the early furnaces were. My own history is I did come from, uh, and I've been there for the last 18 years, at Federal Furnace Cranberry in Carver. And that is a site of, um, of an old furnace that was used to um, will take extract iron out of the soil. The soil is basically heated with wood from the area. The iron melted out, and that was a source of our iron. That land, once it was mined out, then was typically lowlands, sometimes had water with it, uh, very poor soils, was not conducive to growing anything else. And in both Plymouth and Barnstable counties, until we got to the uh, mid-1850s, was basically considered worthless land and was not taxed at all. So there was no use for the land. Um, as cranberry industry got developed, then there was a use for it, and slowly the land became taxed. Uh, but it is perfect land to be reconfigured and to be used for growing cranberries. We're going to work our way through the seasons. In the wintertime, what is a cranberry bog doing to, owner doing today? He's basically repairing his equipment. All the equipment that cranberry bog owners use, basically they're not going to John Deere and saying, I'll, I'll have a picker, please. 
They don't make them. Cranberries is a very niche industry, very small. Most of your cranberry growers are making their own equipment and they've mechanized the operation themselves. Um, if we're lucky, and we haven't been in recent time, the other part of the operation in the winter time is we should have ice. Remember we talked earlier that I need water. We need water uh, for a number of different reasons. One of the first reasons is to put ice over the cranberry bog in the winter to help protect that evergreen. Ideally, we're going to flood the bog. We're going to have a layer of ice form. We'll then withdraw the water from underneath that ice cube, that big ice cube sitting on that cranberry plant, so that now there's oxygen going back to the plant. We can't leave it submerged all winter. We only can go a few weeks. We need to withdraw the water, and then we can mechanically apply that sand over that ice. That is by far the fastest and best way to apply ice to the bog, and we need to do that every five years. The problem has been the last five years uh, with the warming temperatures. At Federal, we've had one day in the last five years where we had thick enough ice where we could drive the sand buggies on it and deposit the sand. So it has changed our, bu our business. Today, um, and coming back a little bit, and I'll get back to the sanding, how are we doing it today, because we can't ignore it. Um, other uses for the water is for frost protection. Remember that cranberry bogs are usually the lowest point in the environment or in our area. And so the, in a cool, cloudless night in the spring, the cold, cold pockets develop, and that's where they are, is the low areas in the bog. Those buds cannot freeze. So we use irrigation system to protect those buds. And as the uh, bud gets closer to opening up, the temperature keeps on rising. And originally, we will start in, um, in the spring, and we can tolerate temperatures down 27, 28. But slowly, it edges up. And, and as the bud develops, we have to keep on um, raising that minimum temperature that we can stand. And naturally, when you coat something with the right-hand picture here with a piece of ice, with ice on the bog, that ice protects the bud. And that's one of the reasons for water. The other was for sanding in the winter. And the third reason we're going to show later is for current day harvesting. Uh, that frost protection is both in the spring protecting the bud and again in the fall. Remember, in the fall, we start our harvest usually about mid-September, and it's lasting through to November. We will have many cold nights in that time period where we've got to protect the fruit, so we'll also turn that irrigation on again. Uh, this is a picture showing frost damage. Um, this is a, uh, was an old-type impact sprinkler, which might have been plugged, and it did not radiate out far enough, and that's damage to the vines outside that little circle there. Important to know today, um, we've had a lot of improvements in uh, technology in terms of our irrigation system, and we're now using sprinkler heads that are very much like what you'd see in a lawn area. They're pop-ups. So we no longer have to be spending the labor of putting sprinkler heads in in the spring and pulling them out at harvest time. This is an example here. What we're seeing here is uh, two other ways of applying sand when we don't have ice, which is seeming to be the new trend in the industry. One is a barge on the right-hand side. Uh, I know at Federal we had two barges. Uh, both uh, have been more recently equipped with uh, GPS, so we're no longer having to throw, uh, we'll call it stakes into the, through in the water to mark where we've been because we have to be very exact in how we're laying that sand over each time. And on the left-hand side is uh, called a terrigator. It's a tri-wheeler, a uh, big balloon tire, so it doesn't leave an imprint in the bog and doesn't hurt the vine. But there's a short period of time when we can do that in the early spring um, when we can use that tired machine. The other part of it is, is that machine on tires is really only good on newer type bogs or firm bogs where there isn't a deep peat base. If it's an older bog that's a deep peat base, it'll still sink and we can't use that machine on it. So a lot of our older bogs, we have to use uh, the barging to get that sand down. 
Uh, well, this is an illustration here is renovation. Uh, renovation is a practice we're doing now. Eventually, most bogs, or a lot of bogs, we have, although I should, I should refer to back up a little, we have bogs that are 100 years old and still providing fruit off of it. Granted, not at a very high level, but they're still producing fruit. Doesn't mean they ever go bad. But what happens is, is eventually various perennial weeds that we can't get rid of uh, with a chemical application, um, like bullbriar or poison ivy, um, gets to be too numerous. The uh, production per acre goes down. And so it, the consideration is brought up for renovation. The other part of renovation is uh, the, the newer varieties that have been developed primarily out of Rutgers University in New Jersey. Our old heritage varieties like Howes and Early Blacks, a farmer today could get 100, 150 barrels per acre. The newer varieties, now it's 400 to maybe 600. So there's a huge advantage. Other advantage, and if you think, if you've ever traveled in the area down in Plymouth and Carver and Wareham, and you see old bogs, when you see these old irregular shaped bogs, that was a function of the time and the lack of machinery that, was had, that we had at that time. It was all done by hand. So if there was a hill in the way, you, weren't, you, you dug around it. You flattened the area out as best you could by hand. Today, with the uh, bulldozers and all the modern equipment that we have today, uh, we can sculpt the land far better. And also, more importantly, we can, with laser leveling on the front of a bulldozer, we can bring a five-acre field within two inches of level over the entire field. Mm -hmm. We have old bogs at Federal where they did it by hand. And if we had a large bog, it could be as much as two to three feet out of level. So when we go to harvest, we'd have to flood, do part of it, reflood again to bring up the water higher, because you can only go so high in your flooding and still be able to get at those berries to lo loosen them off the berries with a new method of harvesting. We'll get to that later. The other advantage is, is we can put in drainage tile, or today you would call it drainage pipe, uh, in the bogs to help drain the bogs quicker. And if we put that in every 16 feet, now I can avoid all those center ditches. So a new bog today will only have one outside ditch going around the outside versus older style bogs. You'll see multiple ditching going through the bog. That also is obviously more management in terms of you've got to dig out the ditches. And um, if it's just one outside ditch around the outside, it's pretty darn easy to do. This is an example, you're seeing two different methods of um, replanting a bog. The one on the right is they've gone to a bog or where they have an improved vine, hopefully. They've sickle barred it, much like you would uh, sickle bar like a hay field, and cut off the vine. You do not lose, you lose the crop that year, but you don't lose the plant, it comes back. You spread it out, then you disc it in. The one on the left is for planting new hybrids. The new hybrids, uh, and there's two methods there that you see. One is kind of like you'd use if you were planting tobacco or strawberries. And the one to the left, um, and we had that at uh, Federal Furnace. It basically is a roller with knobs on it, and you position the knobs so that you get a little dip. You wet the sand, that sand bed down so it holds together. And then you uh, basically throw a plug in each one of those little holes that's left by the nub. Um, and that's the way you introduce new varieties into a bog. So again, what are the advantages? And this is the list here. Um, it is a, and this is one reason why you see a decreasing amount of acreage in Massachusetts and cranberries, because the farmer is able to raise so much more per acre in, to meet demand. And it's because of this. The other part of it is uh, what we're seeing. And remember, the industry started here. Is we're seeing the very oldest bogs um, in areas like Cape Cod, where the land pressures for other uses have increased. So 
that the, la the land around the bogs is just worth so much more money that the, the farm ends up going away. As a, um, when you think of cranberries, think that for every acre of bog, there'll be another three to four acres of upland surrounding and su in supplying that bog with both sand and water. So at Federal Furnace, we had a little shy of 1,000 acres, and we had 252 acres of growing cranberries. The irrigation improvements we talked about earlier, there's that pop-up sprinkler on the right-hand side. These other uh, measurement sticks here are for measuring the soil moisture in the soil. We want to keep the moisture level even, but we don't want to oversaturate it. It still grows in a drier sand. In the summertime is the period of bloom. We talked about, and as a native uh, bee, there's many native bees, and I don't know if you ever have any talks on Cirrus Society or anything like that, but native pollinators, native pollinators are very important to the cranberry industry. We still use honeybees. On average, we'll use a, a hive and a half per acre. So, um, at Federal Furnace, we're, well, we're about 430 hives we had to rent every year. Um, the hive rental industry uh, is a separate industry into itself. There are uh, gentlemen that um, bring the hives. They start out down south, and they eventually end up in Maine with the blueberry crop up there. They happen to stop in, on the way in cranberry country to uh, lease, lease hives there, too. Interesting, there's also, a, um, in the last few years, there's a company out of Canada that is now supplying us with bumblebee uh, colonies. Uh, but those are don't live over, and it's a one-shot deal. The pollinators are very important. Uh, a lot number of your growers now are understanding the importance of the native pollinators. And so when we're refurbishing a bog or doing other work around the bogs, we will be planting a, a pollinator-friendly grass mix, usually mixed with some wildflowers. The uh, secret to that kind of a mix is that it, we need to provide extra nutrition to those uh, pollinators, but we cannot be uh, having it compete when the cranberry is in flower, which is May and June, early part of June. Pests, we do have some pests on cranberries. Remember that it was a fruit that was native to this area. So anytime you have a native plant to an area, it's naturally going to come along with it, um, controlling control, native controls. And that could be both insects and disease. So since this plant was a native to this area, it does have them. Um, I'm happy to say today is a lot different from when I started in the business back 50 years ago when I was selling to cranberry bog owners. Today what we do is, and is actively practiced, and, and again, I have to thank the support of the state of Massachusetts because, believe it or not, we do have an extension service system here, and the one extension service that is dedicated to the cranberry growers is down in Wareham. They established uh, thresholds, and, by, and that allows as to how much, how many insects per square foot or per yard we can accept before we have to do something about it. You do not necessarily, and this goes true for any crop, that even if you're raising it at home, just because you find one insect doesn't mean you have to come out and kill it. It's a matter of threshold. How many can you tolerate before it, before it affects the crop? And so that basically is a definition of integrated pest management. And so the good growers will have either themselves or their help go out and with sweep nets, do collection and understand what is out there for an insect pollination. And if it reaches a certain threshold, which has been determined by the Cranberry Experiment Station, then they'll treat for it. So that's what we mean by integrated pest management. And today, I'm happy to say that uh, the products that we that are approved and used in the cranberry industry uh, are a great deal less toxic than what we were selling back 50 years ago. Harvesting. Um, this is a picture of how 95% of the cranberries today are being harvested, and they call that wet harvest. You flood the bog first. 
Day after that, you're going to come across it with some uh, mach wheel machines. I want to see if I can find that. No. We'll come across it with something to loosen that berry off the vine. Cranberry has four hollow chambers in it. It wants to float. So when you flood that bog, that carpet is going to come up. And if you run uh, anything across it just to hit that berry, it's going to come off that vine, float to the surface. Once it's to the surface, if I concentrate it, both first thing in the morning, I'm going to see what direction the wind's coming from, and then go, you know, let the wind push as much of those berries as I can. Then I'll corral them. That corral is nothing more than the same thing that the people use for uh, cleaning up oil spills. It's on a reel. You bring it in closer, you concentrate the berries, and you see, hope I can get this, right down in there you see three stakes. Underneath him is a square box with a pipe going into it, and there's a pump up in a truck, and it is sucking the water in, and the berries go in with it, and up it goes into a truck. That's the way we're doing it. Initially, when they started uh, doing wet pick like this, they would put a conveyor directly into that pool of berries and bring it up that way. But we've discovered that it's much more efficient to use a pump to bring them up. We talked about the frost protection that has to be done, particularly in a cold night in the fall if we're still harvesting. Today, um, this is a little bit dated. I think it's less than 4% now is dry picked. Our first dry picking was done with hand scoops, and then it was mechanized, and still it's a scooping mechanism. We do not get all the berries off the bog do, doing it this way. The other part of it is, is we do do some, as you can imagine, some damage to the vines when we are essentially combing the vines. The other part of this is we have to comb in the same direction every year. It just like you think of combing your hair. It just has to keep going the same way each time. And these are, your, these are the berries that you find if you buy whole berries, not frozen, in, you know, available in bags from your farm stands or stores today. And they're dry picked. Um, another point to, uh, that is sometimes asked is um, organic cranberries. Step back and we think about it being a native crop because it has all the pests. The native, your organic cranberries in this, in this state, if we have a little over 12,000 acres in cranberry production, there's only 100 acres in organic production. And the reason is, is the production level, if we go organic, is roughly half that of traditional cranberry growing. And there isn't enough of a price spread to pay for it. So there's very few acres being done organically. Most of our organic cranberries that we find in our market today are coming out of Quebec. And again, why are they up there? Because they do not have the insect and disease pressure that we have here. And so they can raise organic cranberries a whole lot cheaper than we can. What we're seeing here is old pictures of cranberries being uh, done, done in bulk and um, there were helicopters being used, and this is for dry pick. Today, there's so few um, berries being dry picked, you're not seeing helicopters used anymore. Our main use of helicopters today is for application of fertilizer, and that would be the main thing. And occasionally, I have seen uh, for digging interior ditches, they'll lay out mats, and then people will scoop out the, um, those ditches, put it on mats, and they'll fly them off too. But those are really the only two uses for the uh, helicopter today. The hand picking, again, going back, uh, this is traditionally how it was done many years ago, and you can imagine uh, the amount of labor that was needed and how slow it was doing it this way. Uh, again, this is dry picked fruit here in uh, historical production. Uh, a federal furnace cranberry, we have one of the largest uh, standing barns in eastern Massachusetts. It's four floors. The bottom, uh, the second floor is where the berries came in on. Uh, this is back before the beginning of ocean spray, so this is up until the 19, early 1930s. Uh, they were dry picked at that time. There was a small village of people that lived there, but then the cranberry, amount of cranberry land at that time was probably around 210 acres. Um, they would come in and they would be on conveyor belts. There'd be, uh, it doesn't show it here, but there's, uh, one means of testing how good a cranberry is is what they call the bounce board test. And if you ever 
do have the opportunity to go into uh, down to Warehammer Carver, stop in at AD Makepeace. They have a uh, they have a neat little store there, but they also have a um, a little museum beside it, and it'll show you the examples of a lot of the things I'm showing you here. But they will also show you this old bounce board, and it's basically about eight boards at an angle. The berries are dumped in, and as they go down and hit the boards, if it's a good berry, it bounces. If it's a bad berry, it has a bad spot, and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so the berries that make it to the bottom, they didn't bounce, and they go out. Mm -hmm. And then there's a great deal of hand sorting that also goes with it. And that's all dry production there. Today, um, and I'd say it's more the uh, late 1960s, and I think it's higher than 96% today, uh, is wet harvesting, and that's what we saw earlier when they were corralling those berries. And there's an example of the berries, how it look with the water over it, the four hollow chambers we talked about, and there's two various machines, a couple, three different machines there, and there's more of what you would see running across the bog after they've flooded it. And it's the idea of anything that will jostle that berry loose off the vine, and they don't need much of a hit to come off. And then the corralling of the fruit. And then most important is up, and it's been a development in the more recent times, is right in the left-hand side, and it's hard to see what this is, but if you come for a cranberry tour, you would see this, and there's the center pictures showing more of it too. Basically, that pump brings it up into the air and to the top there, where it's further washed. And also, there's rotating brushes, and so the bad fruit will come out. We're trying to get as much bad fruit as we can before we send it to the uh, handler. And leaves and other chaff that comes up naturally off that bog. Oftentimes, on um, the other end of that machine there, and it's out of the picture over on that side, there'll be a dump truck to take that um, refuse off the bog. That'll be composted, go back to being loam, and then be used again. You'll also notice in this right-hand picture, you'll see white berries in there. Uh, the handlers will only accept a certain percentage of white berries. They still can be used, your white cranberry juice. And then remember that uh, dried fruit is also an ingredient in many other things today, and they can accept some of the white fruit too. Uh, some of your upper end pet foods, if you read the back of the bag, you'll see cranberries being listed as an ingredient. Uh, good source of potassium, and again, the beneficial uh, sidebars of urinary tract health and all that. Fruit receiving. Um, as I said, it goes to the handlers from the growers. The Most growers are all sending their fruit out to be marketed. There are a few of the small growers that will market their own fruit, but not that many. Most of it is going to about a half a dozen handlers, the largest being farmer-owned, and that would be Ocean Spray. Ocean Spray uses the method of, <coughs> of basically picking up the whole truck and trailer and dumping it. Other handlers use water to wash the berries out of that trailer. Um, I prefer to, th I'll list it in order, the areas where cranberries are grown. Number, number one for many years was Massachusetts. Uh, we lost that title a while ago to Wisconsin. The number two growing region is actually Quebec. Number three is Massachusetts. Number four is New Jersey, and I'm going to list Oregon and Washington together, and they truly are minor out there. Uh, Quebec has really come on. <coughs> Quebec has an advantage being colder. Also, the Canadian um, government is very much, very much differently organized in terms of supporting agriculture than the U.S. government is. They actually get more support up there for agriculture than we do in the States. Um, British Columbia raises a little, and, we're, and you see all these different provinces, but Quebec is by far number one, um, even though the other provinces do, pro do produce some. This is an important slide. Um, this is what it is roughly today, and you can see that the industry has migrated off the Cape to that Carver, Wareham, Plymouth area. 
That's where most of the bog production is today. AD Makepeace um, is the largest grower in the world. They have roughly 12, uh, excuse me, 2,000 acres in production. The total Massachusetts acreage in production is around 12,000. But AD Makepeace has over 2,000 acres. But you can see where it was before in Harwich and De Dennis and Harwich. And there's very little left out there. And again, that was due to alternative uses of the land. Um, Nantucket used to have a very, had one of the largest bogs in the world. And today that is all but five acres of it is gone. The rest of it has been uh, reverted to conservation land. If you think about it, being located out on an island and the cost of getting uh, product both off and on the island, it made it economically untenable. So we talked earlier about how much um, upland it supports, which I think in this state matters for conservation purposes. It's uh, Cranberry farmers are a positive for the environment. In Massachusetts economic, this is roughly correct today. I'm, this is about three or four years old, but there's a lot more jobs after the berry has been harvested than there is in the actual berry production. Um, I will say that the state of Massachusetts does support the industry, both uh, through uh, its support of the Cranberry Experiment Station, which is part of the uh, extension service down in Wareham, and the work, the continuing work they do in terms of uh, helping the growers um, produce more effectively more, uh, more economically and more environmentally responsible. Um, and the other part more recently is there have been grants for, from the state because they recognize that we're at a disadvantage to the newer people that have entered the market where we have all these irregular shaped bogs versus the nice neat rectangles um, and they're helping us to rehabilitate them. If you ask me, how, and you should ask me, how much does it cost you to renovate a bog? Twenty-five to forty thousand dollars an acre. So it is expensive. This is a uh, list of the handlers. The largest being Ocean Spray in the corner. That's a, a farmer-owned cooperative. Um, remember, cooperatives in this state. There are two different types. One is a supply to the farmer cooperatives, much like the old Agway was. Eastern states. Um, Southern states, that was an input supply cooperative. Ocean Spray is a marketing cooperative. So like when you think of Ocean Spray, and everybody knows Ocean Spray, I'd assume. Um, uh, there, for many of the minor crops and major crops, there are cooperatives to help um, sell the product of the farmers. Uh, tourism. Uh, that's, I guess, what part of I am. Uh, I work for the Cape Cod, or kind of more volunteer, for the uh, Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association. We have tours in the fall. Uh, there are bus tours that come through from all parts of the country, which is great. Uh, but even local, more local than here, um, you know, even down people from Plymouth even, come, even you'd think they should know everything about it. But uh, in the weekends, we have uh, tours that go out and usually runs about an hour, hour and a half, and typically during the harvest season so, so we can show people how they, how, they, uh, how they raise the crop and how they harvest the crop. And a lot of people do like going on those tours. Um, this is an ongoing problem, I think, for all farming in Massachusetts. We have not solved the problem, our farmers are aging out, and that goes through in all crops as far as I'm concerned. Uh, farmers are aging out. You do not have enough young people coming in. Um, we haven't solved this problem yet. Um, the average age of a cranberry owner today, I think, is over 60. So we need younger people in, the, in it. But it's difficult, particularly when you see how large a cranberry bog has, or cranberry owner, how much land he has to own, and what the value of it is in the transfer to the next generation is a difficult thing to do. Um, 
the old adage um, uh, of a farmer was his, his retirement was when he sold the farm, and that's unfortunate. So it's tough. Um, traditionally, as we said back in the beginning, it was traditionally on old, old bog land that was no longer suitable for other types of agriculture. That's why you see that traditional peat bogs. <coughs> um, that bottom one is wrong. It's up to 60 now, unfortunately. Uh, competing uses, we're in a fast-growing part of the state. Um, in particular, we all know that Cape Cod became far too desirable. If anybody wanted to go over the bridge in the weekend knows that. Uh, land became a lot more valuable down there, and it pushed away a lot of the farming. Uh, same thing is happening in Plymouth. Uh, Plymouth is the fastest growing town in the state. Um, we're up to 68,000 in the town of Plymouth. I cannot believe it. Anyways, um, so there's land pressures from that, from that angle. Um, the cost of production due to labor, our labor costs are higher here than in the Midwest and in Canada. Um, but your very large, um, most efficient farms will survive in this state. Some of your lesser efficient, they will eventually go. Uh, and this is an example of a Massachusetts farm on the left, typical, irregular shapes. This is what the new farms in Wisconsin and Canada look like in the right. Nice, neat rectangles. And there's some historical figures on acreage. I don't want to go too much longer here. Barrel production. Um, in my 18 years at Federal Furnace, we went from 150 barrels per acre up to our average today is 260. And that was through renovation of some of our bogs. Um, interesting uh, side fact on this. Um, as we go into our supermarkets, we see a lot of our fruit coming out of Chile in the winter. Interestingly, Chile is a government and as a country, they uh, reached a very tactical decision, which I think is brilliant. Hey, we'll raise stuff down here and send it into North America. When they don't have it, we'll get more money for it. And they're right. Mm -hmm. So today, actually, uh, there are cranberries being grown in Chile. And Cran Chile is now actually part of Ocean Spray. When, we're, when Ocean Spray is exporting to uh, different countries, they'll take advantage of that fact. And one of them is take South Korea. South Korea charges a 30% tariff on U.S. Um, cranberries. They don't charge Chile anything. So guess where the cranberries come from? Out of Cran Chile. Um, a little, I don't want to go into politics, but I'll back up a little, unfortunately. Previous uh, chairman of the House, uh, leader of the House, was uh, from Wisconsin a short time ago. That brought attention, unfortunately, to the cranberry industry where a lot of other countries that were trying to uh, get an upper hand in the tariff department recognized that he would be, uh, he would recognize tariffs on cranberries. So all of a sudden we had a mark on our back, all because uh, of that. Um, I don't want to go too much into the health benefits other than to say there was an article that came or a, um, a finding came out from in 2020 from the USDA putting a question mark on cranberries saying, wait a minute, this isn't necessarily a good food for us, for the American public because of all the sugar being used. Uh, the cranberry industry pushed back and said, wait a minute. There's all this other research in terms of primarily gut health and urinary tract infections. Everybody that's ever gone to a nursing home knows that the only juice they serve is cranberry juice. <laughs> they've done that for years. They were on to it. Um, and they then retracted that and said, yes, you're right. There are other, um, there's enough redeeming qualities of that fruit to make it worthwhile to be eating over and above our concern of more sugar in the American diet. Um, and so you notice today that a lot of the cranberry products that have come out are lower in sugar um, or using other 
types of sugar other than cane sugar, which would be uh, more appealing to the American public, but still not limit, but still be able to adjust the sweetness of the fruit. And that's why you're seeing all fruit juices, whether they use apple juice or some other type of juice to raise the sugar content within it so that it is more palatable. And myself, when I'm making my whole cranberry sauce in the fall, I use whole cranberries, uh, about half the amount of sugar they recommend, and then I augment it with maple syrup or honey. And it works out pretty darn good. Um, this is an equivalent in, because they say of how, many, how much you'd be beneficial to for the diet of what it's equal to. And there's a fair amount of uh, juice in that cranberry. Uh, interesting side fact, when they, I've been through the Crazen plant that Ocean Spray has, uh, the juice is actually a byproduct of making dried cranberries. They're actually able to get a uh, concentrate cranberry concentrate out of, as a byproduct out of it, and so it's kept the juice prices low since it's a byproduct. That has been our one number, one hit in recent years is that craisin. If we go back to the uh, formation of Ocean Spray, uh, Marcus Uran was the first president, and he started it back in, whoop, I'll wrap it up quick, uh, started in, in the 1930s, and his first product that he brought out to extend the cranberry market was jellied cranberry sauce. He came up with that innovation, and that's what Ocean Spray did. Previous to that, they sold them when they had them, when they were fresh fruit from September through January, because you can store them for a while. But he was able to then extend the market, and then they started marketing it towards, well, if you can use it with turkey, why not have it with chicken? So that's how they extended the cranberry market. <laughs> Anyways, um, thank you. A uh, couple other notes. If you want more recipes other than these cards that I brought, go to cranberries.org, and that's the website for the Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association. Just cranberries.org, you, know, you can remember that. And there's a ton of recipes on it. There's also more history than what I gave here. If you're really into history, I brought my book. You may be able to find it in the library. If not, uh, my wife looked it up last night. She found it for $20 online. Um, used, it's out of print, and it's uh, Cranberry Harvest. It was put up by uh, Spinner Press out of New Bedford. Uh, a number of different authors contributed to it, but it is a very complete book on cranberry history. And thank you.